Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Um, what's interesting about Jeff is kind of there's this, there's this list of things. Of course, you know, he appeared on TV in The Interventionist, which Chris and I, that was the first time we ever, ever saw Jeff, never realised we'd meet him. And then, of course, you know, he'd been on Oprah, interviewed by Oprah and Larry King, all very impressive. But what really gets the big impression, particularly with the kids, is, uh, is when they know that he's been in a, 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 a rap with uh, Eminem in Monster, with Eminem and Rihanna, Jeff Van Vondren in that. Now, you think that's the killer. But the real deal sealer we found is when people find that he has appeared on South Park, which is there. That's Jeff. <laughs> Intervention on South Park, that's kind of the real deal sealer. So, you know, this is the deal for me. He's made it because he's been on South Park. One day, I'm hoping maybe someday I'll be on the city there on, but who knows. So we love Jeff. Jeff is a genuine guy and you saw his heart. You know, he's, he's a professional who's not a professional, okay? Um, he does his job professionally, but he doesn't do his job because he's a professional. He does his job because of his heart, because he loves people, um, because you saw that his heart's touched by the needs of others. So we're really, really delighted to have Jeff here and that he would come all this way to be with us. So I want you to give him a big welcome. Jeff's going to take some time just to talk to us. Hi again. So, um, you know, I was thinking about Chris's question before about uh, kind of like what was the significant point to change what, what that was. You know, I, when I think about it, the biggest thing for me, the biggest significant thing for me was that I, I just had a really distorted image of God. You know, I mean, I, I think the other night, if you were here, you heard me talk about that the issue with the Pharisees was that they, their behavior was not because they were so devout. It's because they thought that God had a big stick, and if God could do whatever he wanted to do the most, he would hit you with the stick. So your job then was to behave as perfectly as possible so you take the stick out of his hand, and then he doesn't get to do what he wants to do, which is to hit you with it. Well, that's kind of the God I had. I mean... Pretty much. Um, well, um, we used to sing songs that, yeah, as kids, kids' songs, or else hymns in church, too. One of the hymns we sang, it was at Easter time, and it was called At the Cross, and it said, one of the lines in that would, was, would he devote his sacred head for such a worm as I? And, you know, okay, no. So you just felt undeserving, and boy, you were lucky, you know, feeling lucky is not the same as understanding the grace that you've gotten from, from God. But, but, you know, what I think now is that would he devote his sacred head for such a worm as I? And I think the answer is no. He wouldn't. Because God would not waste his son on worms. He wouldn't wait. He, 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 would, he would pay his son for things that are worth the son, but not for worms, you know. Um, I like antiques. You have a lot of antiques here. I told you this, uh, you know, the other night, too. You, you actually have antiques. We have, you know, our antiques go back to 1860, and that's about it. You have antiques that are like, I don't know, 600 years old, 1,000 years. That is an antique. And um, so I go in stores for, to buy antiques because I like, you know, um, buying stuff all year for my family, for Sue, for my kids, because I'm not, my, my former father-in-law father at Christmas time, he'd hand my former mother-in-law a check and say, go buy a shirt. And I want it to be a little more special than that, okay? So I'm looking all year for stuff that fits people. 
and I'm going to an antique store, and, uh, and here's this thing in the antique store. I'll just use these keys as an example. Okay, so here's this thing sitting on the shelf, and, and I go, wow, what is this thing? I don't know what this is, even is, you know? Wow. Wow, 75 pounds. I mean, <laughs> it's not worth a nickel to me. I, I don't even, I don't know what it is. I'm not paying 75 pounds for this. And then, you know, again, Anthony comes in and he goes, wow, 75 pounds. I can't believe it, you know, and he'll pay that for it. And you can tell what it's worth by what somebody pays for it, and that's 75 pounds. You can tell what you're worth, what we're worth, by what God paid for us. You know, he paid his son for us. That determines the worth of us. And it's okay to let that in. It's okay to know that. But see, where I came from, that, well, that wasn't okay. I remember a song we sang as kids. And you might know it. I don't know. It's called, I'm So Glad That Jesus Loves Me. I'm not going to sing it for you. But the words are, I'm so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I'm so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. That's not the gospel. You know, that song says, okay, like, God really loves everybody else, and okay, you know, all right, he loves even me too. That's not the gospel. The gospel doesn't say, for God even loves you. It says, for God so loves you. God so loves us, not even us. Understand that? And so I, get, I, I grew up with this whole big distorted thing of, uh, of God. And then, and then what that did was it really messed you up because since you're not perfect and you can't live a perfect life, it puts you at odds with God all the time. All the time. Because it's normal not to be perfect. That's just normal. That's not, ex- that's not exceptional. That's not, you know... Um, Strange. That's just normal. So I want to just. I'm just gonna, you know, take you through a chapter in in the in the Bible that means a lot to me, and that really kind of straightens this out for me. And hopefully, it'll do the same thing for you a little bit. And it's in, it's in Luke 15. So Luke 15 is 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 uh, in Luke 15 is a story of the prodigal son. And it says this, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me, and he divided his wealth between them. Now, basically, what he was, the only way you can get your, your inheritance would be if the guy who has you in his will dies. So he's going to God, he's going to his father and saying, why don't we just make this be the same as if you were dead, drop dead dad, and give me the money, you know? So... Uh, he divided his wealth between the two sons. He gave, you know, he gave, div- divided his wealth. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together. And he went on a journey into a distant country, and there he squandered his estate with loose living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in the country, and he sent him into his fields. Only, oh, and, and he went and attached himself. Now, you know, I mean, what? do we call things that attach themselves to things? Yeah, leeches, parasites. So this, this son, you know, the, one, one thing I want you to notice here is that the father doesn't give the son a lecture. The father doesn't um, uh, send a head to his buddy in the other country and say, you know, my son's headed your way. Why don't you just give him a nice job when he gets there? Um, he just says, here's the money, goodbye. He doesn't follow him around or whatever. Um, he's gone. But now he's a leech, and he, he, he attached himself to a, you know, a citizen who raised pigs. And, um, and when he spent everything, a severe famine occurred in the country, and he began to be, be in need. So in other words, he wasted everything. He partied hardy. He wasted everything, and now he needs a job, and he goes and attaches himself to a guy who raises pigs. This is a Jewish story, so this is a, really, this is a Jewish guy that's in a really bad situation here because not only does he not have anything, not only is he having to work with pigs, but he's a Jewish guy who's not even allowed to be around pigs. He's not allowed to be around guys who raise pigs, 
And now it says he's longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the, that, that the swine were eating and no one was giving him anything. Then it says, but when he came to his senses, now in my work as an interventionist in addiction, I don't think there's a coincidence, I think I said this the other night, that there's a, there's a, uh, those two things run together. No one was giving him anything and when he came to his senses. But that's not what I'm going to talk about tonight. What I'm going to talk about tonight is, uh, he said to himself, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger, so I'll get up and go to my father and I'll say to him. And then he makes up a speech, like what he's going to say to dad when he gets home, to try to smooth this over and get back on dad's good side. He makes up a speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight I'm no longer worthy, worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired men. Now you see, this is a really lousy repentance. It's still a repentance, okay? This isn't working, I'm going home. You know, my life is off track, I'm going home. That's a repentance. But a real repentance, a really good one would have been, I will go to my father and I will say, Father, I was really wrong and I am really sorry. But this guy says, no, I will go home and say to my father, I'll, I'm, I'll become a servant. I'll pay you for what I did. You know, I'm not worthy to be your son. So, he got up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. What does that tell you about the father, by the way? Because the story of the prodigal son is not about the son, it's about the father. Okay? So, what does it tell you about the father? While he was still a long way off, the father saw him. He's looking for him. So the picture I have is the father gets up in the morning, goes out to the barn or whatever he's doing, you know. I don't know if they have barns in Israel, but okay. And, uh, and then he stops, and he looks like this, and he's got a long driveway. It, in my mind, it's like an, a Texas driveway. It's got a thing on the thing with, with antlers on it, you know, or something. Okay, but he looks down the driveway, and is my son there? No, he's not there. Okay, so then he does his job. Then in the evening, he goes back to the house, and he stops and looks. Tomorrow morning, gets up. Nope. Every day, every day, every day. He's looking for his son. Got up and came to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him. He felt compassion for him. What does that tell you about the father? Loved him. He felt compassion for him. He didn't go, oh, well, well, there's that idiot. Finally woke up. Felt compassion for him. His father saw him, felt compassion, and ran. The Greek word there is not ran, it's raced. Any, anybody here ever, like a racer, you ever race? See? When you race, you don't run, you run as fast as you can. That's what you do when you race. So he saw his son and he ran as fast as you can. Now, I don't know if you can picture this, but these guys wore like skirts, like not skirts, like big long robes, right? I mean, all you gotta do is turn on any TV about anybody back then who's an Israelite and they're wearing long things like that. So you can't run as fast as you can with one of those things on, which means he would have to hike it up like this, which was not okay. I'm serious. You cannot do that. That it makes you ceremonially unclean. There's a rule against that. So basically what the father is doing is he's saying, you know what, that when it comes to sons who have run away and are coming back, that's a dumb rule and we're not doing that rule anymore. Do you understand that? That's just, who does that look like? Remember when, when, when Jesus healed the person on the Sabbath and he said, hey, you can't do that. And he said, well, you know what? That's a dumb rule. We're not doing that anymore. There are more important things than the rule. People's lives, people's health, people's well-being. So it says he ran. He raced as fast as he could. Embraced him. The Greek word there is began embracing. Whenever you see a word that says began doing something, it means started and kept doing it. 
So he ran as fast as he could, and he hugged and hugged and hugged and hugged some more and hugged, 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 and kissed, began kissing, and started kissing and kept kissing, and kissed and kissed and kissed and kissed. He was so happy to see him. So the son says the speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. What's the rest of the speech? What is the rest of it? Make me as one of your hired servants. Okay, in other words, you don't have to take me back as a son because I'm not worthy to be that. I'll just come back as a slave. That'd be okay. But the father isn't even listening to the speech and doesn't even let him finish the speech. So in my mind, you know, the kid is like groveling and the father's over here looking at this person here But the father said to the slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fat, fattened calf and kill it for my son who is lost is, is back home. See, so in other words, the, the problem here is that the, the younger son had a mis, uh, 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 an inappropriate, like a, a, a distorted image of what the father is. See, he thought that in order for the father to accept him, he had to be worthy of it, and obviously he wasn't worthy of it. So the father couldn't possibly accept him. So he's going to pay for it. He's going to pay for his sin. He's going to grovel and pay for his sin. And what he didn't understand, and, and, and you know, in, in this story, because there's another brother in this story, and he's the brother that did it right, and he didn't go running off, and, you know, he's, he's jealous because the son's getting all this attention. And I'll bet there are people here in this room, you know, that have a sibling that raised hell and got all the attention in your family. And you're going, wait a minute, how do I get attention? You know, I, I'm doing it right. I mean, that's, that's not that uncommon of a, of a scenario. But um, see, the older son, he had a distorted image of the father too, because just like the younger son thought, you have to be worry, worthy and I'm not, the older son thought, you have to be worthy, and I am. But neither one of them understood was that it's not about being worthy. You're not, the, you know, the, the issue is, it's not about being worthy to be the son. It's about the father acting like the father. You're not worthy because you did it right or didn't do it right. You're worthy because the father is your father and, that's, and you're his son. That's it. And that applies to the prodigal son, although the Greek word prodigal, you know, doesn't mean rebellious. Like this is the story. I grew up thinking this is the story of the rebellious son. It's extravagant. This is not the story of the prodigal son. It's the story of the prodigal father. And this son is an idiot, and he's got a bad repentance, and he wishes his dad would drop dead, and he goes and wastes every possible thing he could, and he ends up fighting with the pigs for actuals carob pods. And he's got a lousy repentance, and he thinks he you know, owes his dad and everything else. And his dad says, okay, so you know, put the robe on him. Let's put a robe on him. Now, the Greek about this is the robe has a family insignia on it. See, this is, I, in my life, I'm the younger son. And I'm, I'm the guy that, you know, gave God the finger and said, I don't need you and goodbye. And I don't deserve to be taken back and you know I'm I, you don't have to take me back as a son I'll just I'll just live like a slave and that's me that's my part of the story you know and then he he says put a ring on him put a robe on him the robe said the, okay, this is, just blows me away. It's like what he said was, I want to put a robe on this guy so that when you see him, you can tell by what he's wearing this, this is 
This is my son. See, I'm, I'm the one. who wants to hide, but the father doesn't want to hide me. You know, or you, he wants to show us off. And put a ring, and that was, this was a signet ring. So in other words, what they used to do is, if there was a contract, the way they signed it was they melted wax and put a, you know, signet ring. So, so in, in other words, he's got, now he's got that ring, and so that means if he goes over to this other town and makes a deal, he's got the Visa gold card here, okay? If he goes over here and makes a deal and puts the signet ring in there, it's exactly the same as if the father had made the deal. This is so contrary to what the son deserved or and expected, you know. And of course, then the older son, he's going, well, uh, you know, I've been doing it right. You never threw me a party. I, I do deserve it. So he didn't understand the father either. You know, so here's, here's the application, and this is for any of you that, you know, struggle with this or have ever struggled with this or might ever struggle with this. Is that if what you need to know is that if you ever get in a situation where you give God the finger and say, you know what, I don't, I, whatever, there are different ways that that happens in people's lives. I can do it without you. And you take off, and you're down the road, and you hit the wall, and it's not working anymore, if what you need to know is that you have a father that looks and looks and waits and waits and looks and waits, and when he sees you coming back, he's gonna run as fast as he can and throw his arms around you and hug and hug and kiss and kiss and throw a party because you're back, you can know that. And there are some people that need to know that. A lot of the people I I work with, you know, and doing interventions and they're into drugs and all that kind of stuff, they used to know God and love him. And they, something happened, you know, and they said, that's what God's about. I'm out of here. And now they're, you know, and, they, and they're worried that if they turn around and come back home down that long driveway that God's really, you know, kind of hiding in the bushes with the big stick so he could finally do what he'd rather do, which is to hit him with the stick. That's not, you know what, that might be your father, but that's not our father. That was kind of my father, but that's not our, our father. Well, there's another story here. This is in verse 3, same chapter. What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep, has lost one of them, doesn't leave the 99 in open pasture and go after the one who's lost until he finds it? And when he found it, he says, lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost, I tell you that in the same way there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous people that need a repentance. And the other night I said, now remember there is no 99 righteous people that need repentance. There's just 99 righteous people who need it but don't think they do, and then one who needs it and knows they do. Okay? That's not what I'm gonna say tonight. This is not a prodigal sheep story. This is not a rebellious sheep. This is not a sheep who goes to the, you know, the, the, what do you call it? The sheep keeper. What do you call that guy? The shepherd. Okay. The shepherd. And says, you know what? Screw you. I don't need you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go do really nasty sheep behavior and you don't, I don't care. This is just a sheep for Pete's sakes. So all the sheep are walking along, and he's just a sheep walking along, you know, and then a butterfly comes. He goes, oh, wow, oh, wow, butterfly, look at, oh. And he turns around, and all the sheep are gone. <laughs> wow, where'd they go? I'm lost. Can't get his way back. You know, maybe doesn't know the way back. Maybe he even got his wool stuck in a picker bush called addiction or something. 
But this is not a rebellious sheep. This is a wander off sheep. See, okay, so if what you need to know is if you are the rebellious son like this who says nuts to you and you take off that when you hit the wall because life's not working and you turn around, you got a father that waits and waits and waits and waits and waits and runs and hugs and kisses, you can have that, you know, you can know you have that father, but if what you need to know is that if you're not paying attention and you wander off and you get lost, that you have a father that looks and looks and looks and looks and looks for you and when he finds you, you don't even have to get back under your own power. He picks you up and carries you back. Then you can know you have that father too. So which father do you need to know about? What woman, if she has 10 silver coins, you know, in order to do this, I need a coin. Somebody have a coin? All I have is euros and I, I, I you know, I can't, they're useless. I almost put them in the offering. I did. I, I turned to Sue. I said, should I just throw these euros in the offering? Okay. <laughs> you know, you'll figure out a way. You'll figure something out. I don't know. Okay. So here's a coin. All right. What woman of you, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search, search carefully? So now, see, this is not a rebellious coin, obviously, because coins can't be rebellious. And this isn't a lost coin who, like a sheep, wandered off under its own power. You understand? It's just a coin. So in other words, for it to get lost, it would have to be like sitting here with the other coins. And then remember, they wore these flowing robes and stuff like that. And so somebody walks by and, 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 and it, gets, it gets knocked off. But it's not sitting right there because it says, doesn't sweep the house and search carefully. So in other words, it's not just lost, it's really lost. Like it's gone underneath, it's in a dark place. It's in an underneath place. But this woman lights a lamp and sweeps the house and searches carefully when she finds it, and when she finds it, she brings everybody together and has a party because the lost coin is found. You know, now here's, here's this. You know, some people I work with, they got knocked off the dresser. You know, they got, they got sexually abused or beat up when they were kids or, I, I don't know. They got knocked off. And they're in a dark place and they've been in a dark place and they feel dark things, and they feel dark feelings, and it's dark. So if what you need to know is that if you are rebellious and wander off or leave and say, screw you, God, I can do this myself, you, you have a God that when you finally hit the wall and say this isn't working and you turn around and head back, you've got a God who waits and waits and waits, and when you come back, he runs and hugs and kisses you and throws a party because you're there, you can know that. And if what you need to know is if you're not paying attention and you wander off and finally you figure out you're lost, you know, if you're lost, just make a bunch of sheep noises. Bah, bah, that's all you gotta do. Because he's looking for you. I mean, you can't, I mean, that, you, I don't know, that could help, I suppose. <laughs> when he finds you, he puts you on his shoulders and carries you back. You don't even have to go back under your own power. But if what you need to know is that you're in a really dark place because somebody that was supposed to be the safest person in your life turned into the least safe person and hurt you and wounded you. That you have a God that looks for you and not just looks, but looks carefully for you. Then you can know you have that father too, see. And none of these might be your father, but this is our father. And, uh, and if you don't need to know that, then that's great, but then I'll bet you know somebody who needs to be reminded of those things too. And that's the, you know, the thing you had on the board before about love, except for, you know, that's the do part. You, maybe you need somebody who needs to be reminded of that. Maybe the, the only reason they're not coming toward God is because they don't know that, and they're still thinking he's in the brush with a stick, and he's not in the brush with a stick. You know, I have, 
I grew up being taught that you had to be dependent on God. You had to be dependent on God. But really what we were taught to be is codependent on God. Codependent on God is that we believed that when we woke up in the morning, we had to live that day in a way just right so we wouldn't cause God to have a mood swing. Do you understand? Like, in other words, because he, he's like looking at us, deciding if he's going to have a good day or not based on if we do it right. Yeah, come on. And that's not dependent on God. That's, that's codependent on God. And that's living to try to take the stick out of his hand and stuff. And instead of living that way, live with a, a view of him looking at you with a smile and being willing to say how much you are worth by what he was willing to pay for you. And, um, and then if you get in trouble like one of these guys, he's looking and he's coming and he's glad when you're back. And I'm done. Thanks, Jeff. So anybody want to come to Father? Words don't mean anything unless actually they produce a, an action, a reaction in our lives. For, for many of us here, we, we had a, some of us can put our finger on that moment where really what we did was came to Father. This person Jeff was describing, there's terminologies in churches and in Christianity that describe that in various ways. Some people call it being saved. Some people call it being born again. You know, some people call it when I came to Jesus. The, the, the title that's put on it really is just a way of describing that what really happened was you, you came to Father and you knew it was this guy who he talked about because he reacted towards you in exactly the same way that he reacted towards these people in the story. That's a moment where it's like a contract has been sealed. It's like forever and forever and forever. Something like he talked about the, the young son who had the father's ring so that when he put his ring in the seal, that, that was the father's contract to you to say, this is a done deal. And... Um, you may be on a journey of faith, I don't know where you are, but, but what I'd like to invite you to do tonight, because there's no time like the present, is, is, is to come to that Father, or probably more realistically, let that Father come to you, because this idea of him running down the drive is... You know, we, we kind of have this image of we, like he said, we have to grovel to God and we have to come. And if we can make 99.999999% of the way to God, well, shucks, you know, I'll just, well, you've tried hard enough, maybe I'll come. That, that is not, that's a wrong lens. God so loved the world that he gave. He didn't say, if you can find a way to get to where I am, I'll accept you. The whole business of Jesus was, I'll find a way to get to where you are. So God becomes human flesh. God becomes humanity. God becomes one of us to reach to us. And, and so the truth is today, you don't have to be good enough. You don't have to have done enough. You don't even have to know what the right prayer is. You because there's no right prayer or wrong prayer. All, all you got to do is, is really accept the reality that totally exists for you, which is this Father coming to you, finding you, dusting you off, loving you, kissing you, saying, I've been waiting for this moment all my life. And so I, I just want you to do, just bow your head right where you are. And if, if that's you, I just want you to quietly just just... Just tell this Father, I receive, I receive your love. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your kindness. I receive your welcome home. Because that's really what it is. <laughs> What's lovely about that is that he doesn't have a list of stuff that he says, okay, before, before I welcome you home, let's just go through this list of all the stuff. There is no list. All that's on his heart is welcome home. 
And if you receive that tonight, it, it, it's, it's not an issue that, that how God sees you will change. It's an issue of now how you see God will change. Okay. Because God's never had to change how he sees us. It's only us who have to change how we see God. And when you meet this person, you will never doubt the reality of God. You will never doubt his existence. You will never doubt the truth of it. Because I'm not here to prove anything to you, just to say, hey, when you kind of experience this, you'll know what I'm talking about. So it's open to you. Do that right now if you want to, because I know he's accepting you. And he will receive you. And you'll be blessed. And we want to help you. Pretty laid back people. But want to help you on that journey just to uh, express what that is all about. Okay? And, and, and to enjoy that journey. So, having said that, if you want to talk to any of us, we're always hanging around here. We're done. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. We are honoured by your presence. And, uh, and um, if you want to get a hold of us, do so. Or have a blessed evening. Have a blessed time. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again, not on Wednesday because we're not here, but next Saturday night we will be here. So we bless you in Jesus' name and thank you, Jeff, for sharing your heart. All right, we're done. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.